Thrive Church. So glad you joined us today. Hey, my name is Tyler, one of the One Youth Leaders here, and I'm so glad that you're here with us. Wherever you're coming from, Alaska, Mississippi, nobody goes to Mississippi, or your couch, or your car, so glad you're here. Hey, we have some live hosts that are standing by, willing to talk with you, or willing to pray with you, so drop a comment or a like down there below, and they'll, they'll be there for you. Hey, we're going in a time of worship, a time of my favorite part of Thrive Church, so stand up, Join us and praise with us. Well, good morning. We are so glad that you are here with us today. Would you sing with us? You have brought me to the water Where my past can be swept away In the current of your mercy And I know I'll never be the same. There's a limit to your promise. Jesus, you have done it all for me. 
Well, as we continue in worship this morning, we're about to sing a song that has one of my favorite lines in it. And the reason why I love this line so much is because it states, God, to you our hearts are open, that nothing here is hidden, and that you are our heart's desire. And what I love about that is that we can be transparent before him this morning, that we can bring our worries, our, our troubles, and also our praise to him and lift him up over those situations. So I wanna encourage you guys today, sing that with us this morning. Thanks again so much for worshiping with us this morning. Hey, I got my, uh, my beach shirt on here. Let us know on the, in the comments below. Did you visit the beach this past Memorial Day weekend?
Hey everybody, it's Josh and I'm out here on the Thrive property, excited as tonight we are hosting a worship night right here in this space. I've got my car out here, uh, I've been testing it out and uh, it's, it's gonna be an awesome night where we get to gather together right here and worship God. So we're gonna have you come on out, drive your car right onto the property. Uh, you can feel free to uh, bring some lawn chairs, you're gonna have a space to park, we're gonna be socially distanced, bring some bug spray and bring a great smile as we uh, laugh with one another, sing with one another and worship God together on this space that he's given us uh, to reach our community, to do some incredible things here. And we're gonna be praying also uh, for what God has for our future and where he's positioning us to make a huge impact in our community. So I wanna invite you to come on out tonight at 6.30 right here, right off of Wallace Road. If you don't know where that's at, you can go to our Facebook event online. You don't have to be on Facebook to go to our Facebook event and you can find there's a pin dropped uh, right to where I'm at right here. Uh, if not, if you go on 359 and you turn onto Wallace Road, you can't miss us. Uh, we're gonna be out here having a blast together. So don't miss it tonight at 6.30. Uh, also, in-person services launch next Sunday, next Sunday morning. Uh, if you've been waiting to do it, uh, this is your time. You're going to be able to come out. Make sure to reserve a ticket. It's limited seating because we want to make sure that we are abiding by CDC guidelines and keeping everybody safe. We've got a cleaning team that's going to be working on getting everything uh, ready for us and sanitized before, in between, and after services. So reserve your ticket on our website, thrivechurch.cc, and make sure you come out for our in-person services um, if you feel comfortable. And if you don't, we're going to be streaming online so you can feel free to stay on your couch and have a great online experience with Thrive there as well. Guys, we're really looking forward to it. And uh, here's Tyler with a little bit more information for you. I don't know how many of y'all saw Josh get stuck in the mud. Hey, Josh, I was didn't get a missed call. I know you're looking for a real man with a beard. Um, I don't know if you're still there or not, but good luck. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Tyler, one of the One Youth Leaders here. Hey, and over the last uh, six to eight weeks, we've had 18 kids join our online service on Zoom. And we've done crazy stuff from delivering quarantine buckets with a six foot pole to their house, to having Starbucks delivered online live to them for bringing friends to the on Zoom a virtual service that we have. One of our mission statements here is doing anything and everything to reaching people. And check out our website where you can support and show our, your generosity so we can continue to love on our students and to reach our community. We're going into week three of our series called When God Seems. Check it out. Thrive and welcome on into our online experience. My name is Kristen and I'm one of the pastors here at Thrive Church. We're so happy that you chose to join us online today. It's kind of crazy because it has actually been 11 weeks since we last met in person. And Josh and I are so excited because we're headed back to in-person services this coming Sunday, June 7th. So make sure you reserve your tickets. And hey, if you're more comfortable viewing online, we're still going to be live streaming. So you can view via Facebook or our online church platform. So Josh has been back in Chicago this week. He's actually was finishing up our move, packing up our house and packing up the pods. And he drove back down on Thursday. So we are thrilled because we are officially Houstonians. We are finally here for good. And I, I mean, I guess we live in full, we're going to live in full sure. So I don't know what that's called. So if y'all could let me know, is it full Sharonians, full sure, right? Is there even a thing? Is there even a thing? Of we, how, do we call, how do we call ourselves? <laughs> so we're thrilled to be back um, here in Fulcher. We've been in the midst of our series over the past few weeks, When God Seems, and we've been asking the question, what do you do when God doesn't do what you think he should do? We talked about when God seems indifferent, when God seems uncooperative. And I had a moment back in January this year that I was actually traveling. I traveled quite a bit for work when we lived in Chicago to and from Houston. And whenever you travel um, out of Chicago in the winter, you know it's going to be a little bit questionable with the snowstorms in the winter up there. So I'm heading back from Houston back to Chicago in January, and sure enough, a snowstorm is about to hit. And I have a late night flight. I think it was like an 8 or 9 p.m. flight. And so I'm at the airport early trying to get in line at different gates for standby. 
keep in mind, I'm traveling for my work, so I'm all by myself. I don't have my three girls. Josh isn't with me. I get to choose what I want to eat. I get to choose how leisurely I want to take my time. And sure enough, my flight is delayed. So I'm walking around the airport trying to find opportunities to jump on standby. And I get to this one gate, and it's busy. And so I'm waiting in line, again, all by myself, none of my little girls. And there's a family standing behind me. It's a dad and a mom. And I swear, it was probably three kids under five. So they were busy. They had their hands full. The five-year-old standing there next to the mom. The dad is holding probably the two or three-year-old boy. And the mom is holding a baby girl. And as I'm standing in line thinking, oh, this is so frustrating. Why do I have to be, why am I going to miss, not miss my flight, but why is it going to be delayed? What if it's canceled? What if I'm stuck in Houston? All the questions. Starting to get really irritated in the fact that I'm possibly stuck in Houston. And I turn around and I see this little boy in his dad's arms start to like make that motion that you know as a parent that you're like, oh no, here, here it comes. And sure enough, the kid just throws up all over, all over the front of his dad, all over himself, all over the floor. And so I go into mom mode and I'm like, they need help. Okay. So I look at the mom and I'm like, what do you need me to do? I'll do whatever you tell me to do. What do you need? And she's looking around frantically and I can see the wheels turning in her brain of clean up puke, take the baby, help my husband. What about our other? What? And so I look at her again and I say, what do you want me to do? And she says, can you just take the baby? And she hands me this like seven, eight month old baby girl. And they start to clean up after their little boy. And it was in that moment that I had a complete shift in my perspective. And I thought, oh my goodness, how easy did I have it here all by myself while there's this mom and dad with a child that's just gotten sick all over the airport. (laughs) Today we're going to talk about when God seems late. Have you ever been there? Something's delayed. Something's taking longer than you expect it to. The answer isn't coming as quickly as you would like. And during this series, we've actually been looking at heroes of faith and the way that they have felt the same way we feel. We've talked about John the Baptist. We talked about the Apostle Paul. And today we're going to talk about a story that many of you have probably heard, the story of Lazarus. We find the story in the Gospel of John, chapter 11. And John's a book in the New Testament written by a follower of Jesus, John. So let's look at John, chapter 11, verse 1. It says this, A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. In some versions and some translations of the Bible here, it says the one whom you love is sick. In verse 4, but when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus's sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God, so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. So let's stop there for a second. In verse 5, John specifically mentions John, Jesus' love for Martha, Mary, and Lazarus separately. He doesn't say he loved this family, but rather he points out each one individually. And it, showing us that Jesus had really close friendships with each of these people individually. I think sometimes when we think about Jesus in scripture, we think of a man who walked alone with followers following him. Rather than walking this life with friends next to him. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were all close friends of Jesus. So close that in the midst of pain, in the midst of concern, the sisters reach out to Jesus and ask him to come to their rescue. Wouldn't it be nice if they had cell phones where they could have texted Jesus and been like, Jesus, hey, Lazarus is sick. Can you come on over? Can you take care of him, heal him, do all the things that we know you can do? And Jesus can respond, yep, sure, I'm on my way. I'll be there in just a little bit. Well, they didn't, they didn't have that. Rather, they send him a message, and they don't hear any response. In fact, he doesn't leave where he is for two more days. He stays put. 
here the sisters are waiting for Jesus to walk into town, and he hasn't even left where he is yet. They probably expected the messenger that they sent to return with Jesus, but no such luck. I mean, how would they feel in that moment? If you're like me, when I send a text message to somebody and, I'm, and, and I see that three bubble, like the three dot bubble pop up, you know what I'm talking about? Where you're waiting for their response and they're typing and you're like, come on, how long are they typing a paragraph or they're typing one word response? What, is, what are they gonna say? Well, Mary and Martha were just waiting, not even knowing if he was on his way or not. In verse eight, it says, but his disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going there again? So basically here, as Jesus has told them they're going to go back to Judea, the disciples are getting really, really concerned, right? They're saying, well, are you, I mean, are you thinking straight here? Don't you remember that these were the people that were just trying to kill you? The disciples knew that they were going to follow Jesus. They knew they were going to be loyal. And so here they're sharing their concern because they're really concerned that they're going to get back and they're all going to be killed together. The story continues in verse 11. Then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I'll go and wake him up. And it's funny here because the disciples actually thought Jesus meant asleep, but Jesus looked at them and said, or they looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. Like, it'll be fine. Like, we don't need to go back and risk our lives. So in verse 14, it says, so he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And in verse 15, and for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there, for now you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. Throughout scripture, when there's stories of Jesus and his disciples, it's really neat how we get some pictures into the disciples' personalities. And here, in a verse, we actually see the personality of Thomas come out a little bit. I mean, if we remember, the disciples were really concerned about going back to Judea and the fact that they're all risking their lives by following Jesus back. But he looks at Jesus and literally says, let's go to and die with Jesus. <laughs> I mean, if that isn't the Eeyore of the group, you know, Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, that's like, do, 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 let's go die with Jesus. I don't really know who is. So Jesus arrives at Bethany and he's told that Lazarus has been in the grave for four days. Theologians actually say that Jesus waited four days on purpose because there was a Jewish Jewish superstition that said that the, the soul stayed near the grave for three days, hoping to return to the body. So it was well accepted that after four days, there was no hope of resurrection. And here comes Jesus. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she didn't wait for him to get to her house. She actually went out to the gate and met him. Can you imagine a woman who hasn't gotten a response from someone? I mean, if I was texting Josh something important and he didn't respond, you better believe that when I see that car pulling in the driveway, I'm like marching out to the car like, you better have an answer for me or at least give me a good reason as to why you didn't respond. Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would have died or would not have died. I think sometimes we think of Martha and Mary and these women from the Bible and these, character, these people from the Bible as being calm, like, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I actually foresee her being really, really frustrated. She was a friend of Jesus. Jesus knew her well, and she comes out, and I just see her in my mind being like, hello, if you would have been here, he wouldn't be dead now. And she says in verse 22 something that I find so profound. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. So she asks Jesus, why? Why, aren't, why weren't you here? Why were you late? But then she says, even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. There's great power in an even now prayer. Even now, God, after my divorce, I trust you. Even now, God, after multiple miscarriages and multiple infertility treatments, I trust you. I trust that you have a will for my life. Even now, God, when I've lost my job and I don't know where my next paycheck is coming from, I can trust in you. Even now. And after she says that, 
it says Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Look at that. Jesus gives Martha a promise. He says, your brother will rise again. And Martha, not really understanding, looks at Jesus and says, well, yeah, he will rise again when everyone else rises in the last day, knowing that she'll see him in heaven. She'll see him again. She's not thinking about the fact that Jesus is about to raise him from the dead. In verse 25, it says, Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Here we see Jesus calling attention to himself. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He's telling Martha in this moment, he's telling us in this moment, I am the Savior. I am the Messiah that you've been waiting for. And then he looks at Martha and says in verse 26, do you believe this, Martha? He calls upon her to confess her faith, saying, do you believe this? And she says, yes. She's always believed he's the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who came into this world from God. So after this conversation ends with Martha, Martha goes back and tells Mary that Jesus has come. And sure enough, Mary goes out immediately to meet him. When Mary gets to Jesus, she says the exact same thing Martha did. Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. Why are you so late, Jesus? I don't understand. I don't understand why when I sent the message you would have stayed where you were. Why are you late? It says that when Jesus saw Mary weeping and the others around her wailing, he was deeply troubled. And here in verse 35, it says Jesus wept. What's interesting about this to me is that the grief and the tears of Mary and Martha moved Jesus to the point of emotion. He was emotional because of their pain. He saw their tears and was touched by them. He was sad himself because Lazarus was his friend. And if, God, if Jesus saw Martha and Mary's tears, I can know that he sees mine. I can know that he's touched by my tears. He's touched by my grief, and he's moved by my pain. As Jesus is responding, he asks them where they had put him. And once they get to Lazarus' tomb, Jesus calls upon Martha to act. In verse 39, Jesus says, roll the stone aside. Martha actually looks at Jesus and is like, um, you realize he's been dead for four, in here for four days, which means it's, uh, it's really not going to smell great. She looks at him basically saying, you're too late. The opportunity has passed. He's not the Lazarus that you once knew. The time for goodbye is over. You missed the opportunity. I called you and you didn't come. You're too late. He again calls Martha to act on her faith. In verse 40, Jesus responded, Didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they roll the stone aside. And Jesus shouts, Lazarus, come out. And in verse 44, it says, And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a headcloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Can you imagine Mary and Martha's response at that point, their face? I mean, they literally were just telling Jesus how he was way too late, that he had missed the opportunity. And here they are standing, watching their brother walk out of this tomb. Have you ever said that to God? Have you ever looked and said to him, why were you so late? You missed it. You missed the opportunity to show me who you are. You missed the opportunity to strengthen my faith. You missed it, God. Have you ever been there? I've been there. Sometimes God seems late, and sometimes God seems like he's not doing what we expect him to do. Sometimes when we think of the heroes of faith, and in this story, Mary and Martha, maybe Wonder Women, <laughs> 
we think of them as being able to handle everything, not affected by anything. But what I love about this is that we see that they were human. And even more than that, we see that Jesus was human. He was empathetic towards his friends who had lost their brother. He hurt for them. He knew in the moment that he was watching the process of Mary and Martha's faith grow in the delay. But yet he still hurt for them. He still ached for them. Jesus hurts for us when we walk through seasons of delay. When we walk through seasons where we're asking him, God, why are you late? And I think what makes it so difficult is it's that in those seasons where we're asking God why he's late, he feels our pain, but he doesn't, it doesn't mean that the outcome is going to change. It doesn't mean that the end result looks different or the feeling of him being late disappears or the emotion or the frustration goes away in a miraculous way because you're asking God why he's late. Although the result, the end result doesn't always change, God gives us direction in the delay. The first thing, the first direction he gives us is he gives us a promise. Just like he did in this story where he told Martha, your brother will rise again. He gives us a promise. But what's key here is that Martha had to chase after Jesus to receive that promise. She had to listen. She had to bring her concern and her pain to Jesus. And in turn, she received a promise. Are you listening today? I could ask myself that same question. Am I listening when I come to God and I bring my concerns and my frustrations and I'm asking him for a promise? Am I listening for it? Am I looking for his promises in the one place we can find truth above all else, his word? If for nothing more, there is an amazing verse in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. And it says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And sometimes in our life, that's the promise we hold on to. Sometimes it's not your mom will be healed of cancer. Sometimes it's not your dad will be healed of Parkinson's disease. Sometimes it's that God, during this delay, during this frustration, you're never leaving me. You're here. After Jesus gives us a promise, he draws our attention to him just like he did with Martha, when he says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He gives her a promise, just like he gives us a promise, and then he draws her attention to him. He brings her back to him, his promise, his purpose on this earth. Have you ever been so focused on the problem of a situation that you blind yourself to the solution? that you can only see what's happening here in front of you. You can't see the solution behind it. But if we change our focus and we focus on God and focus on Jesus and the promises that he's given us, our attention turns to him. If we're going into his word to find his promises, our attention turns to him. Jesus gives us a promise. He draws our attention to him. He calls us to confess our faith. He asks us, do you believe? Do you believe that even in the delay, even now, even in the hardest parts of life, I'm here? Do you believe that I'm good? Do you believe that I have a plan and a purpose for your life? Do you believe? And after calling us to confess, Jesus calls us to act. In this story of Lazarus, he calls them to roll the stone aside. What a crazy request, right? I mean, Mary even, or Martha even looks at him and says, Ugh, Jesus, it's going to stink. But he calls us to act. If during the delays of life, if during the really crappy times in life, we can look at God and say, Work on me, grow on me, grow me in this process, change me in this process, God's purpose for our life will always be more clear. God's promise for our life will always be more clear. This right here, this is action. This is faith. Being in the moment of pain, in the moment of delay, 
shouting, God, you're so late. Why are you late? Why are you not showing up? That even in that moment, we have enough faith to say, God, even in this midst, even in the midst of this pain, I will trust you to change me, to change me, to grow me, to help me learn more of who you are from this situation. If we can do this, if we can look to him in the midst of delay, it all becomes more clear. A lot of times the delays feel like denials. I think of our um, two-year-old Parker Grace. So if she asks a question of us and she says, Mom, can I have a sucker? And I'm like, oh, just ask me later. She's like, Mom, can I have a sucker? Maybe. Mom, can I have a sucker? Let's, I'll talk about it later. Mom, can I have a sucker? And she asks and asks and asks until I literally say yes or no. Aren't we like that when we're asking God for something and we don't hear the answer we want or we don't hear a solid answer? It's like we're hearing a no. I mean, that's why our two-year-old keeps asking because she's like, if I ask long enough, they're going to say yes. And to be fair, most of the time, she's probably right. (laughs) She wears us down. But that's what God wants. God wants us to keep chasing after him, keep bringing our concerns to him, bring our emotion to him. As we close today and the worship team sings this song, use it to reflect on what God is telling you in this moment. Do you feel like God is running late? What's your next step today? Do you need a promise from him? Do you need to know that he is always there, that he will never leave you nor forsake you? Or are you in a spot where he's drawing your attention to him, where you feel like you have that promise, you know he's there, but he's asking you to focus more on him? Are you chasing him for truth? Are you surrounding yourself with people that are pushing you towards him and and pushing your focus to him? Maybe today that you need to confess and that you believe that he is the savior. He is the resurrection and the life. Maybe he's been calling you to act. There's something you know he has asked you to do this week and this is the week to take that step of action. What is he telling you today? Jesus, I pray as we listen to this worship song, God, that you would speak to our hearts, God. God, point us in the direction that we need to go this week, God. Do we need to look for a promise, God? Do we need to act? Do we need to confess that we believe that you are good and we know that you're the Savior and we know that you hold everything in your hand and we know that you love us, Jesus? What is it today, God? Allow that to be reflected in our hearts. Challenge us today, God. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Hopefully you enjoyed that worship song there. Hey, thank you for hanging out with us. Thank you for being a part of our church and continue to support our community. Hey, starting June 7th, we have in-person gathering. I don't know if you're excited about it, but I am. Check us out at 930 and 11. You can get your tickets and more information online. I hope you all have a wonderful week, and I can't wait to see you all in person. Come on!